Hello, everyone. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Welcome to RPV City Talk on the road. I am with the great mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Dave Bradley. And we're going to get right to it. We have a lot to talk about with the mayor, his monthly update. Thanks for being here. So let's let's just let our audience know where we are. We're literally on the road at the top of Crest Road. Yeah, so we're up at the FAA uh, air traffic control radar sites at the top of Crest Road, the highest point in Rancho Palos Verdes and also the highest point on the peninsula, which gives a great overlook for the air traffic control radars to be able to see the LA Basin and do air traffic management. A little known fact that these domes were originally part of the Nike Missile tracking site, but then when the Nike Missile Base that is now City Hall was deactivated, the federal government transferred these over to the FAA and they continue to track the aircraft in the LA Basin today. Right. And I, I, as Dave noted, we are at the highest elevation on the peninsula insulin in Rancho Palos for you so we can say um, Mr. Mayor that we are on top of it in RPV right now we we are totally on top of it but as far as the history goes um, regarding you know we I think for the community that travels around the hill we look up and a lot of people refer to those to like two white golf balls right it's the golf and, balls and actually when I first moved here I thought that they contained water like I didn't know what they did so um, the fact that you chose this location made me dig a little bit about the history um, and I reached out to the FAA to find out what happens behind this gate because the public isn't allowed um, to be back here for security reasons. So, like you mentioned, the FAA took over um, management in 1975. And um, there's a great history to learn about these um, radar domes. And, in fact, only one is working. Oh, one, I did not yes, know that. there you go. So one is operational and one is not. But for more about what the current use is, I did, like I say, reach out to the FAA. And I spoke with their um, specialist, public affairs specialist on the West Coast, Ian Greger. Here's what he had to say about what's happening here at the radomes. The facility houses a long-range radar that basically tracks aircraft at higher altitudes. And it feeds two of our facilities. It feeds a, a center in Palmdale that handles aircraft pretty much at cruising altitude. And it also feeds an approach control down in San Diego, which tracks aircraft as they're flying into and out of air, airports in throughout Southern California and between airports. And the signal goes out about 200 nautical miles up to an altitude of roughly 40,000 feet. We have a technician on site during the day, and we have technicians available 24-7 in case anything arises at any other time. And we perform routine maintenance on the, on the, the radar, which might involve taking one of the two channels out of service. And, and the cool thing about this, about our radars, they have multiple layers of redundancy. So the radar has two channels in case one becomes avail unavailable due to maintenance or any other fact. Our FAA facilities, our air traffic control facilities, all of them are fed by multiple radars. So the center up in Palmdale feeds from about 15 different radars and our approach control in San Diego, I think from 11. We have about slightly more than 380 nationwide and this includes about 150 long range radars like the one in Rancho Paralos Verdes which has a radius, the signal radius of about 200 miles. And then we have shorter range radars, about 234 of them that have a signal range of about 60 radars. And they typically feed airports and our approach controls. Radar facilities like this are really critical to the safe and efficient operation of our national airspace system. Uh, so for that reason, they're just not open to the public. This has been a critical radar facility to the FAA for the better part of five decades. And while the outside of it looks like it's the same, we are constantly maintaining and upgrading the equipment on the inside. And that's, you know, that's a process that we go through nationwide all the time. And the, the effect of the upgrades is really, you know, it's not visible to the traveling public. For our viewing audience, if you're interested in learning more about this facility, there was an article written in the Daily Breeze a couple years ago by a journalist, Sam Gnier, and it's phenomenal. You get all the information from the time that the actually Army first purchased this property, right? And then, right. It, so there you go. But great spot to bring our community the show from. We have a lot to talk about. Um, you just came from your mayor's monthly breakfast, and also um, you were just at Marymount California University, which is right down Crest Road here at the bottom of the hill here where you were met with the president because there has been an annu announcement 
that Marymount California University is closing. So yes, I started out this morning by having breakfast with uh, all the committee chairmen and commission chairmen, uh, kind of going over the state of the city. We do a mayor's breakfast once a month. Uh, from that, I went to a meeting with the leadership for Marymount California, who last week announced, unfortunately, that due to budget constraints that they are going to cease operations. So we had an opportunity to sit down with the leadership and talk to them about what was going on at Marymount, California and some of the operations. This has all uh, happened within the last four weeks, so this is all very preliminary. They had uh, entered into a uh, memorandum of, of agreement with St. Leo University out of Florida. Uh, unfortunately, some of the finances just weren't closing. Uh, so the board of directors of uh, Marymount, California uh, made the very difficult decision to cease operations and to start winding down operations at Marymount, California. Our discussions this morning kind of revolved around what their plans are and how that would go down and how to work with the city to make sure that we preserve the community as best as possible. Things are still way in the early stages. Um, in fact, this has all happened within the last three weeks. Correct. I know it wasn't month, was it just months ago? Like you said, you were at that announcement that there was going to be a partnership or merger with St. Leo's. Um, and um, as a member of the community, my children went to Marymount Preschool. We all have a connection with it. It's played such a vital role on many levels and will be missed. And I'm just grateful that for the time, the decades that they that they served our community. And we'll stay tuned to as we know more about what the future holds for that property and the city's involvement. And of course, we will cover it on RPV TV. Absolutely. All right. Well, you talked about we've had so much the month of April. Every month when we do this program with the mayor, you talk about where you've been. There's been you know whale of a day, budget workshops, civic center advisory committee works. All of these great things happening because we're busy and good things are happening. So oh, how about a state of the city, a absolutely. brief state of the city? So as we look down on the rest of the city here at the top of the hill, uh, things are really good. Uh, going great. Uh, the city is coming out of the pandemic. We were able to host Whale of a Day in person this year. The next weekend, we followed that up with the annual Easter egg hunt. We did it up at Civic Center this year. The kids came out and had a wonderful time. I got to start the uh, bedlam that was the Easter egg hunt, which was so much fun is to see all those kids out there. In fact, we sold out in a record time this year for the number of kids that we could have there. So that was really fun. You did an excellent job hanging out with the bunny. I I saw. An excellent job, <laughs> Liz. Come yes, on. I had to. Yeah, it was fabulous. Um, yes, and we had the um, budget workshop. We had the infrastructure um, workshop. Mm -hmm. um, we've also uh, kicked off the um, Ladera Linda project. So right. we did the groundbreaking, and the uh, demolition is now underway for Ladera Linda. So a lot of things happening in the community. Um, on the heels of that, we're also uh, kicking off the Civic Center design. Uh, so the Civic Center Advisory Committee uh, met this week to continue the discussions of what the Civic Center is going to look like. Uh, we've reached out formally to the United States Coast Guard to look at the Battery Barnes Bunker property, which is actually um, in the middle of what the city uh, owns at that property right now and working with the Coast Guard to see if we can get that transitioned over to the city and incorporate that into an overall city, Civic Center project, which is all really exciting working with the federal government for these federal local government partnerships, which is so exciting for the residents of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And as you bring up all these projects, let's segue into this is budget season. How is all this getting funded? Um, we've had budget workshops and, and city council and staff are working on the 2022-2023 fiscal year budget. So how about talking about what what's going on with that, projects that we can stay tuned for, things like that? So the budget for Rancho Palos Verdes is actually very strong. I mean, we did some really good financial planning over the last several years. So coming out of the pandemic, where some municipalities are in a bad state financially, uh, Rancho Palos Verdes is not one of them. Uh, we're in a very strong financial position. Um, our city revenues are coming back faster than anticipated. We were very conservative in our budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, some of our major tax contributors are coming out of the pandemic uh, very quickly. Uh, or much quicker than we had uh, anticipated. Uh, Terranea's operations are back to almost full swing. The uh, Trump National Golf Course's operations are doing very well. So our revenues are up. 
Um, unfortunately, some of our expenditures are down, but that's because of lack of staff. So we're continuing to recruit some key positions in our Department of Public Works, mm -hmm. which has been a little bit harder to uh, resource and staff than we would like. But those type of things have all contributed to a budget surplus that we've uh, enjoyed in the last year. So we're going to take some of that budget surplus and look at those things that we need to do in the city. Uh, Ladera Linda kicking off is one of those. Uh, looking at the Civic Center, uh, looking at Portuguese Bend that we've been um, uh, working with federal and state partners to get it funding to be able to take care of Portuguese Bend and come up with a long term mitigation solution to Portuguese spend. There's some numbers we have written down here. I don't know if you want to share some specifics when you take a look at just what's going on with the general fund um, revenues, uh, including transfers. Transfers were projected to be at $34.9 million, which yep. is 3.1 million or 9%. 0.7% more, which is what you were saying, that right. increase. Um, but then it also talks about the fact that expenditures um, will also be projected at 33.2 million, which that was according to our incredible um, finance director, yes. uh, $4 million or a 13.7% increase in expenditures. Right. So there you go. So we, we are spending a little bit more, but making a little bit more. Is that the Absolutely. bottom line? The city is trying to budget very prudently and uh, make sure that we are on a sound financial footing. We don't want to get caught uh, unawares and get put into a bad financial spot. So we are trying to make sure we have the maximum amount of uh, city services and uh, support the community in a very fiscally responsible way. And a great way for our community to stay um, in touch with what we're doing on the budget level is just go on to our city website, rpvca.gov, and all that information is right there. You can follow along and see the proposed budget. Now we're going to talk about city goals, city council goals. You're working on that with staff, developing them for 2022-23. Yes. And also um, looking at a new way to uh, deal with the goals. And right. that was your idea. Why don't it you was. And talk to make a more user-friendly approach to uh, for the community to look at the goals for the city and make sure we're, we're achieving those. So right. go into that for us, will you? So we're trying to morph our goals process from one of a bunch of different disparate goals and kind of rolling them up into major projects. Previously, we were tracking about 140 different goals for the city for mm -hmm. any individual fiscal year. Which which is really confusing, very time consuming to maintain. Uh, we're trying to roll that up into seven or eight major city goals with sub tasks right. to go execute on those goals. It's taking some project management uh, 101 tools and techniques that I use in my everyday business uh, and applying them to city business. And hopefully this will allow city staff to be more efficient. It'll be easier for them to status council on our progress, uh, show council where uh, maybe we don't have the resources allocated properly to execute a goal and council can then sit down and see if we want to reallocate uh, resources or if we want to modify those goals and those timelines. So right. I think it's going to be a much better closed loop cycle mm -hmm. uh, for us to execute in the future. Because there's six major categories, like you were saying, whether it's public safety, it's infrastructure, quality of life transparency um, and so there and everything sort of now is falling under that and they've the staff has done a great job like you're saying in reducing the number of overall go yes. goals and and also to make sure that we're hitting them and I think I like the way they color code the chart right. so you see like green light done right or yellow means getting there and red we got to work on it absolutely and it's all about just making sure we prioritize what the council and the community wants from city staff and we give them clear direction on how to go execute. Unfortunately, you know, we have many more goals than we can afford to go actually implement many more projects. And this is just a way for us to triage them and give staff uh, a good uh, heading check on uh, what to go off and execute. We're going to move on to our next subject, which we've been made headlines for months is Hatano Farm, a farm in our city that right now we are trying to, the city is going to go forward trying to get a, a historic designation for what is yep. the last Japanese farming operation in on the peninsula. So why don't you give us an in update? In the South Bay, yes. actually. When I grew up here, you know, we had a, a Japanese American farm that was operating at Torrance Airport. We still had several Japanese American farms operating in Palos Verdes. The last operating one is Hitano Farm right at the foot of the uh, Civic Center. We are working with looking at federal, state, and local designation as a historic site be able to give that uh, sense of history to the community 
of what the Japanese American farmers meant to the South Bay in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and on. Mr. Martinez is the longtime uh, operator and was the former foreman of Mr. Hatano, and he's still working the property today. And we're looking at ways to help Mr. Martinez stay on the property. It will not be operated as a commercial farm, but we're looking at other ways that we can continue to operate it as a farm, incorporate educational and historic aspects into that operation and having a living historic monument. I know my children went back to historic Williamsburg, right. which is operated as a living uh, historic monument. And we're trying to use that type of mindset to go after how we can operate Hatano Farms. So when you're talking about that the city staff is looking into different ways to designate this as a historical location, um, you're doing it, this, like you said, state and federal level. I know you've reached out to Congressman Lou. You're looking for assistance from our state and federal Absolutely. lawmakers to make this happen because they all have different criteria, right? Like you might get one designation, but not the other, but is that Correct. right? Yeah, so we want to involve all levels of government. I recently toured Congressman Liu through the Portuguese Bend landslide area, and we also went by the Hatano farm. And he understands the history of the Japanese American farmer and was very interested in how the federal government can help work with the city to enter into those type of designations. So we're at the early point of that. Uh, city staff is continuing to work plans to be able to come up with some ways that the farm continually can be operated. We're working with the Palisades East Peninsula Land Conservancy on uh, ways to conserve and how we can tie that in to, into the overall uh, land conservancy operations mm -hmm. as we move forward. So uh, it's really a success story on how we're working with all phases of the community. I know, because you brought up Mr. Martinez, the current foreman. When this all first came out, um, then we realized that, well, the city knew that this the lease that was with Mr. Martinez would need to be terminated due to restrictions. It can no longer be used for commercial purposes, correct. either correct, if it becomes historic and all the restrictions. So you're trying to, it's going to be win-win the way you're working Absolutely. through this. And if the Land Conservancy partners as well, and the possibility like of a cacti farm was discussed, a seed nursery, all these things, these great uses, right? Absolutely. So the uh, Palace Fertis Peninsula Land Conservancy, very interested in partnering with the city, as well as Palace Fertis Peninsula um, School District, and in tying in a historic educational component um, into the usage as we go forward. So uh, between the three organizations locally and the federal and state level, uh, it's a really exciting time, and we have an opportunity to do something really uh, cool here um, that will preserve that property uh, into the future for generations to come. So that will be either the areas that we're applying for is the National Register of Historic Places, the California Register of Historic Places, and the California Point of Historical Interest of historical interest. So we are making history in Rancho Palos Verdes all Absolutely. the time, right? And as you mentioned, <laughs> um, National Historic Places, next week, the uh, National Park Service will hear the application for Wayfarer's Chapel to become uh, on the National Historic Registry of Historic Places. Excellent. I mentioned I did used to work at Wayfarer's Chapel and they do already have another historic yep. um, designation. So, and that is just a jewel in our community. Um, and with all the history that's there. So that's exciting and for wayfarers. You mentioned that we talked about the Land Conservancy and the partnership with the city that we have multiple with the management of the preserve. So let's go yep. into our next topic, and that is about the upcoming uh, land acquisition, the partnering of our city with Land Conservancy to acquire 96 acres of more open space. Um, to expand our preserve and with that just give us an update this is incredible news yeah so uh, we signed the um, purchase sale agreement two weeks ago and we are now in a 90-day escrow it will close june 30th and that is to acquire 96 acres over just north of wayfarers chapel the last of the major pieces of property on the peninsula that is uh, open space so we will bring that into the preserve it's the what is referred to as the lower filiorum and plum creek properties mm -hmm. but Which this surrounds the uh, catalina view garden it does surround the catalina view garden and it's a true win-win uh, this was a combination of federal funds, state funds, local funds, and private funds with the uh, Land Conservancy all coming together to bring that property into conservancy uh, and preserve it for the future. So just a incredible win-win, uh, very exciting. Things moved very quickly and the city was able to take advantage of this consortium to be able to do a true win-win-win for everyone. 
Yes, and also that it's a habitat corridor. I mean, this is a critical piece of property for the uh, preservation of the Palos Verdes blue butterfly. Absolutely. And the uh, gnat catcher and several other mm -hmm. native species yes. of plants and animals. So we'll be we'll be paying attention to that. And I know in terms of public access, when this all happens, there are going to be a couple trails I think are connected. But the most part is called a habitat corridor. It will be a correct? habitat corridor. There will be a, a trail at the upper portion of it that will connect uh, and be part of our integrated trails network plan. But uh, it is mainly for conservation, not for active recreation. But it should. Uh, preserve that land uh, for generations to come, which is uh, incredibly exciting that we can uh, take uh, 96 acres into conservation again. It, it, it's just a once in a lifetime opportunity. This is incredible. So we will we'll stay tuned in June for the final word that this land deal has gone through and congratulations to all the parties involved. It's, it just continues to enhance quality of life in our city. Thank you. And, um, and speaking of enhancing the quality of life for people that are on bikes, skateboards, and scooters. We, they have more access in our city for unmotorized wheeled devices are now allowed in several city parks. It's a pilot program that under your leadership we've launched. So why don't you uh, explain this really good Oh, <laughs> this really good endeavor on the city's end. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're rolling forward <laughs> yes. with, with a pilot program. Now, um, so several months ago, uh, several residents came to us um, with an issue that there really wasn't a place for children to learn how to ride bikes or ride scooters. We live in a very uh, hilly area and we sitting up here at the top of yeah. Crest is a, is a great example of uh, how you would not want to teach your child how to ride a bike uh, down Crest. So we are starting a pilot project to allow limited wheeled vehicles in our parks, in three of the parks actually, and see how that goes. Uh, we are very aware uh, that some of our seniors use our parks for recreation because it's relatively flat. So we're trying to make sure that we have the best um, combination uh, to serve all the population. So we're doing it as a pilot program. Um, we've had some very positive things, uh, positive letters, um, but we've also had some negative uh, on where people were surprised coming around corners and things like that. So we're working through it. Uh, the rangers are there in our parks trying to help uh, sort that out and we're trying to make it sh where it's safe for all and uh, everyone can use our parks and uh, recreation areas uh, the best uh, ability possible. And those three parks are Eastview, Hess, and Point Vicente Interpretive Center Correct. on trails, um, not yep. in like public patio areas. Right. And for that feedback, if you're interested, you can email the city at parks at rpvca.gov for the next six months. I'll be looking for that feedback and, and then see where it goes from there. But I know I caught up with one family up at Hess that were super excited with their, their kids out, yes. their helmets on. And, and I think it's intended for the youth on bikes. I mean, yes, it's really focused on the younger kids learning how to ride bikes in a very protected uh, and safe area. You mentioned the rangers are going to be monitoring this program in the parks. And as I'm sitting here, we hear the birds chirping and we're out in the thick of nature at the top of Crest Road here. Um, which makes me think of what's what's also a big topic right now in the city, and that's what's going on with our wildlife, um, with the coyotes specifically. The um, city just hosted a wildlife watch forum that was yep. super important to give information how we can coexist with coyotes, which are right now with breeding season. It's been a, it's been I don't want to say wild, but it has been wild, right? right? So, what can you share with our residents right now? What they should be aware of? So it's interesting. So we did on the 29th have the wildlife forum out in the community. Uh, we also sent out a newsletter to everyone in this city. In fact, I read it uh, last week, which does give some ideas on how we can coexist with wildlife in the community. Because we live in a semi-rural area, it's unfeasible to think that we're not going to have wildlife. Um, and that's, you know, some things that may be um, more provocative, rattlesnakes, mm -hmm. uh, coyotes, but there are tools and techniques to be able to coexist with that um, and have nature in balance. So it's really going through and covering trash, taking away food sources for the coyotes to come into people's yards and become very comfortable with people. It's making loud noises, which considered hazing of the wildlife to give them a healthy healthy respect and fear for people mm -hmm. and to keep them out of people's yards. Well, the city does have a wildlife management program with the coyotes. So yes. 
again, I keep, I keep pushing the city website, but that's a great way. And, and we are tracking the coyotes, right? So you Absolutely. Can, you we, on the call. city website, you can identify and show where you've seen coyotes. You can certainly identify if they're aggressive, if they have lost their fear of people. And the city tracks all of that. And we will change our conservation plan to be able to support uh, any aggressive coyotes to take care of that. I know at the beginning of the show, you did in your uh, giving us a brief state of the city right now, mentioned Ladera Linda, which that was the groundbreaking, yes. talked about moving forward with Civic Center. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Do you and want to highlight anything about the timelines going forward with these projects? Things people need to be aware of, especially at Ladera Linda right now, um, because about the parking situation, it's closed off to the public for Correct. 18 months. So Ladera Linda is a 16 to 18 month project from groundbreaking through completion. We're in the demolition phase right now, which is is super exciting. The buildings were way past their prime. They were semi-temporary buildings that were put in in the 60s and still exist almost 50 years later. So uh, there were significant structural issues with those buildings. So mm -hmm. it's exciting to see it moving forward. Community park that's going to be there in its place is going to be lovely. And it's going to be really exciting for the east side of uh, Rancho Palos Verdes to have a facility like that to support community events um, and recreation and there's a Jason park and parking available for visitors right now when Correct. they come up there not to, you know they can't park in the neighborhood obviously oh exactly yes. so um it's parking up along Forestall drive up towards the preserve and where the um towards where the soccer fields while are. the construction so that's right. going to be super exciting and hopefully it'll come in on time and under budget absolutely <laughs> um we are have done to the last few minutes here i don't know whether um in terms of i wanted to have you highlight your mayor's honoree program which is incredible you're honoring um, outstanding uh, citizens in our community and there was a very special young man that showed up at council meeting um, during April you want to tell us about your honoree yeah Kate Robinson was uh, this is one of the things that as mayor is so exciting when you get to honor somebody like this Kate Robinson is a 10 year old resident of the city he was uh, involved in a program that was highlighting fashion designs for people that have limited mobility or physical issues that don't allow them to wear normal clothing. And he was one of, uh, of uh, several folks that were doing mm -hmm. a runway show in right. downtown Los Angeles. And Cade Robinson, just really a local hero. And it was so exciting to honor him, meet his family. He brought a bunch of his school friends with him to see him get honored. Yes. Um, just a a, a fantastic kid and outstanding uh, he's he has cerebral palsy he does and um, when he was doing that as one of the 70 models i understand was for the uh to mention the he was doing it for the D runway of dreams foundation Correct. so to let right and, the, and they uh sponsor clothing that allows right. folks with mobility issues to self-dress themselves and be more uh self-sufficient it's such a great good news story it, yeah, it was phenomenal. he was incredibly inspiring all right so we've just a few minutes left and time for your mayor final mayor's announcements anything you want to share you've been busy this month just mayoral activities that you want to let the community know about <laughs> I don't know that there's anything specific except you know coming out of COVID I mean it's something we're going to be living with but it's exciting to be back out in the community see folks come out for whale of the day see folks come out for the Easter egg hunt being able to see folks coming back to city council meetings getting community involvement again mm -hmm. it's just been really exciting as the city reopens up being up here at the top of Crest overlooking the basin is you know it just reminds me of how beautiful and what a phenomenal place we live in um, another beautiful day in Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, as we get out and about Rancho Palos Verdes, one of the things as mayor, uh, you know, I challenged uh, RPV TV about doing these um, discussions in different places mm -hmm. around the community because we do live in such a diverse, beautiful community. It just seems like getting out and about is just so much fun. And I really enjoy coming out <laughs> to all of these different well, places. It was uh, fun to be on top of things, I have to say that, at the highest <laughs> elevation in RPV. And also, you know, like you say, we're traveling we have some beautiful landmarks in our community and certainly those white golf balls as people refer to them are, are certainly a, a site that we have to note and just it was great to kind of be kind of find out more about the history of them as well so we will see you next month on the road thank you mayor bradley for all you're doing serving our community doing a phenomenal job and uh, stay tuned. Well, I don't know where you're going to take us next month. You'll have to think about that. Absolutely. We'll right. find another good place. Of course. Another secret spot. All right. You take care out there. Thank you for joining us for this edition of RPV City Talk on the Road. Have a great one.